Oh, hi, Sarah. Hey, Katie. It's so good to see you. Of oh, hello. I'm so happy to see you too. First and foremost, congratulations on your victory yesterday. Um, you won with 73% of the vote, right, Sarah? That's exactly right. Exactly that is right. So um, well, I have so many things to ask you. First of all, I mean, what was your reaction? How did it feel when the vote count came in and you saw that you had won? Well, first off, I, I was overwhelmed with gratitude. Um, gratitude to the residents of this district who've entrusted in me the responsibility of representing them in the Delaware State Senate. Uh, gratitude to the supporters and volunteers who put so much time and energy into this campaign. Grateful to have the opportunity to serve and hopefully join with my colleagues to make meaningful progress for Delawareans. But it was also surreal. Um, I, I, I think just quite frankly, it's hard to process when you grow, grow up not seeing someone like yourself in not just politics, but really any position of, of public trust or leadership it's difficult to be what you can't see. And so in many ways, I think I'm still processing the fact that what once seemed so impossible to me as a kid growing up is now not just a possibility, but here in the first Senate district, a reality. I know that you want to serve the people of, of Delaware as a state senator, but not as a transgender state senator, and that you really campaigned on some kish kit I'm tired, Sarah. It's been a long day and night. Tell me about it. <laughs> On kitchen table issues. Tell me some of the things that you talked about that really seemed to resonate with Delaware voters. Yeah, you know, what was so important to me from the start is that people understood all of the life experience, all of the passions I bring to the table, all of the issues that I care about, because the issues that are keeping my neighbors up at night are the issues that have kept me up at night. Um, we are obviously experiencing an unprecedented public health crisis, but the issues and the challenges we're facing with COVID-19, many of them existed long before the pandemic hit. And from the start of the campaign, I've said that I wanna be a state senator who was not only born and raised in this district, but a state senator who was a caregiver, a state senator who's passionate about fighting for healthcare for every Delawarean, real benefits for working families like paid family and medical leave. So. From the start of this campaign, we were talking about making sure that we're lowering the cost of health care so that more Delawareans can get the care they need. We've been talking about passing universal paid family and medical leave. And as we've seen with COVID, the fundamental principle uh, that no one should have to give up their income in the face of illness is one that whether it's COVID or cancer, we should make sure no Delawarean has to make that impossible choice. We've been talking about reforming and reimagining our criminal justice system long before the, the current um, historic inflection point uh, that we saw this past summer. And we've been talking about the need for quality education for every child, no matter their zip code, long before we were experiencing the challenges of, of, social di of distance learning and mm -hmm. remote schooling. And so, these are the issues that I've been talking about, and they're the issues that I was hearing about from voters. How um, so I would ask you, Sarah, how tough was it to campaign in the midst of a pandemic? You know, it's interesting because, you know, just looking at the presidential race, uh, there was a lot less door-to-door -door campaigning by the Democrats, and, and the Trump campaign continued. I think they knocked on a million doors, and you know, there is no substitute, I think, for that one-on-one -on -one relationship you develop with voters. Was it hard for you to kind of uh, make your mark, given the fact that you had to be super careful campaigning in the, in the middle of this thing? Yeah, COVID certainly required all of us, I mean, to become creative in how we connect with one another. And campaigning is certainly no different. Here in Delaware, we're a small state where voters expect to meet their kids, get to hear firsthand not just what they're passionate about, but why they're passionate about it. Look them in the eye. And so COVID really presented significant challenges for a state where our politics is, is, is based in personal, in-person conversations. Um, I was lucky that I started this campaign a long time ago, July of 2019. I it feels like a, a world away. And so there were seven or eight months of this campaign where I was out on the doors 
a year out from the election before COVID hit, having thousands, literally thousands of conversations on the doors. When COVID hit, actually before it hit, as it was, it was, or as it was hitting, um, we were actually the first campaign here in Delaware to announce that we were suspending our in-person campaigning and moving virtual before the state shut down, before the party recommended that this happen, before any other campaigns started canceling events. In fact, I think some people thought we were uh, a, a little uh, a, a, a little too quick to do that, I think, huh. at that moment. Um, but it was important to me, based on what I was hearing from public health experts that I was talking about, that we model the kind of leadership that our communities deserve, which is leadership that's based in, in, in data and science. Um, so we moved virtual. And there was a, a lot of um, incentive as things started to open up to, to move back to the fully traditional in-person campaigning. But for me, it was critical that we continue to campaign responsibly and safely. I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, at the, in the same breath, criticize President Trump for his handling of the COVID crisis, while at the same time, you know, going door to door, talking to voters who, in many cases, might, uh, you know, unintentionally answer the door without a mask on. Right. Um, I, I didn't want to be unintentionally spreading the virus, even if it was, you know, safe. And so we moved our campaign virtual. And what we did instead of door knocking was phone banking. And uh, as I'm sure you can guess, that's a slightly different experience. Yeah. Um, but despite the, the move to the phones, voters were just as warm. Voters were just as eager to have a conversation. And so we actually ended up talking probably to more voters over the phones than we ever would have been able to talk to going door to door. Um, I think there was some, some worries that it might cost us votes that, that it, you know, voters, because my Republican opponent was door knocking. Um, right. But I think in the end, I think voters responded um, with the percentage you cited at the start uh, in a way that that validated the responsible and safe campaigning that that we were intent on uh, on doing. Well, you're such a, a compassionate, eloquent person. You know, I've always been so impressed, Sarah. And I know very much that you don't want to be uh, you don't want to be known as a transgender state senator. Having said that. I imagine that your candidacy, your campaign, Sarah, gave you a really um, incredible opportunity to help educate people, to help uh, you know people become more comfortable with people of different gender identities. Uh, you know, I did that documentary. You were so helpful to me in, in helping me understand. Uh, issues of gender identity and uh, the experiences of trans people and um, you know and you were so supportive of me doing that documentary and it's something I'm still so proud of Sarah but tell me about what that was like campaigning and um, you know did did people ask you questions uh, and and how did you use it as as kind of a, an enlightening opportunity if you will yeah, it, it's such a great question. And, and I actually talk about uh, trans people. I just saw commenting my good friend, Gigi Gorgeous, uh, who's, who's watching, who's just an oh, incredible, uh, incredible trans uh, leader. Uh, uh, she is, has an amazing following and talk about people who've opened hearts and changed minds. So Gigi, love you. Um, you know, I've spent the last 10 years helping to educate, not just the, the country, but specifically the Delaware community um, mm -hmm. about what it means to be trans. And I, I am grateful that I've had the privilege to help lay that foundation. And I think, you know, in many ways, the, 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 my candidacy and the result we saw last night was only possible because of decades of advocates who have opened hearts and changed minds and laid that foundation. Um, my gender identity never came up in conversation with very few exceptions, very few exceptions. I certainly wasn't running on my gender identity and voters weren't bringing it up to me with the exception of maybe a handful of people. And a, a small group of those folks would ask me genuinely earnest, earnest questions. Maybe they read a, an article and they just couldn't wrap their mind about, around what it means to be trans. In those cases, I'd try to answer those questions, but also 
really helped to redirect the conversation back to the issues because I, I didn't want it to become a campaign that that anyone would um, would, would think is is just focused on you know as important as it is or trans you, specifically. Or, or exploiting you know your gender identity and right and right. trying to just on that it was just you exactly. know it's female uh leaders don't want to be they just want to be leaders not female leaders right. or right. at some point we all just want to be known as you know what we are without any kind of specific descriptive term well and, and i'm and i'm so proud of who i am but it's one part of who I am. And I wanna be seen and, and evaluated in my full humanity and everything that I have to bring to the table. And yes, my gender identity is, is one of those experiences, but it's only one of those experiences. In fact, the most formative experience in my life is not my trans identity, it's my experience as a caregiver to my husband, Andy. Um, so, so the very few instances that it was brought up, it was brought up either with, in a few instances, genuinely good faith, earnest questions, um, which I will always respond to with patience and a willingness to educate. Um, but more so, frankly, people who are just excited about the potential for more diversity in our government. We know that we can only craft public policies that meet the diverse needs of a diverse community if we have all of the voices at the table. Um, we know that that's true in government. We know that that's true in business. We know that's true in technology. We know it's true across the board. Um, and so democracy is, is better and stronger when we have diversity in our government. Um, and so there were certainly people who were excited about, about that. Uh, but, but, but for the most part, 95 to 99% of the voters I talked to, the conversations were entirely about education, healthcare, paid family and medical leave, livable wage, criminal justice reform, the shared hopes that we have. And I think that's one of the most important things that I feel in this moment, which is that whatever symbolic or even substantive impact my election has in the context of LGBTQ equality, the only way I can honor the LGBTQ community fully and to ensure that my success last night is not the end of the story is to do the best job I can for the voters of this district. And that's the best way I can honor the young LGBTQ kids who might have found a little bit of hope in the message from last night. It's to focus on the voters, focus on my constituents, focus on the needs of this district and to deliver. You know, um, oh, by the way, I was gonna ask you if you had gotten in touch with Dan, is it Danica Rome or Rome? I don't wanna pronounce Danica's name incorrectly, but she's from my home state of Virginia. And um, she is, was, uh, in 2017 was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates. Woohoo, go Virginia. And I'm wondering if you and, and Danica at all uh, met and compared notes and talked at all. I love that question because I love Danica. So Danica, first off, is a huge inspiration to me. She is, her election to the Virginia House of Delegates was the, the moment for me and so many other people when we realized that we could have a seat at the table that our voices mattered and that we could run for office and win. Um, I've gotten to know Danica. First, I met her when she was still running, helping to support her campaign. Uh -huh. um, but I've gotten, uh, in the years since, uh, I've gotten to, uh, to get to know her as a friend and she's been a constant source of support. I mean, she's genuinely one of the most gen generous people that I have met and she pays it forward. And it's really funny because Right after the polls closed at 8 p.m., I was in the car and refreshing the election result page as I drove to the, the what would become a victory party um, in, in a, a small business in my district. And I'm looking at the results and 8.15, they post the absentee ballot results, which for this election were a massive portion of the voter universe. And we won that, that absentee vote with 86% of the vote. Um, and at that point, I knew based on what had just come in that there was, it was, it was all but certain that, that I would win the race, that it would be very difficult for my opponent to, to get enough votes on election day to, to win. So I look at that and literally within 30 seconds, my phone lights up with a call from Danica, Aww. who was, who was clearly refreshing the page. And so <laughs> she was the first person I talked to 
in the moments after I realized how likely it was that we would win. Oh, that's so awesome, Sarah. Hey, um, you know, first of all, do you think Joe, I mean, gosh, I have to ask you, even though it seems uh, that Joe Biden is on the cusp of victory, uh, we're waiting for Arizona, Nevada to be called, but Michigan and Wisconsin has have been called. He just needs those two states, I think, him to bring him to 270 and doesn't necessarily even need Pennsylvania, which was supposed to be the, the key, the keystone state. Um, so, uh, you know, did you have a chance to get to know him at all, to meet him, to talk to him? Because obviously he is uh, the son of Delaware. Yeah. Yeah. He is absolutely our favorite son. One of the privileges of my life is knowing Joe Biden and, uh, and knowing his son, Bo Biden. Um, I worked for Bo. Bo was a, a, a friend, a boss, a mentor to me, one of the I, kindest people I've ever met. I forgot that you had worked for Bo. He yeah. Is, uh, he was such a, such a wonderful person, wasn't he? He really was. He was the real deal in every sense of the word. He was as compassionate and kind behind closed doors as he was in public. I, I had the privilege to be his, his field director and, and what they call body person, um, so sort of traveling aide when he was running for re-election as attorney general. So I got to drive him around Delaware. And uh, he was a really good person, a really just decent person. Um, you know, Senator Harris, hopefully soon Vice President-elect Harris, talks about how her introduction to Vice President Biden was really through Bo's eyes. And while I'd grown up in Delaware and, and met Joe Biden in passing, I really got to know Joe through Bo. And the love that they shared for one another, that they share for one another, the support that they had for one another. One another. I mean, I'll never forget, jo Bo and I would be out for 12 hours in a day and every single day at the end of the day, we'd be driving back from the state fair and he'd call his dad, who was the sitting vice president at the time, to talk to him, to get his advice, to talk about the kids, to talk about the family, they just had an incredible relationship, close relationship. Joe, Bo was, was Joe's heart. And, and so since Bo's passing, I've gotten to know Joe Biden even better. Um, he has helped me heal in the aftermath of the loss of my husband. And that's one of Joe's most profound qualities is his capacity to see people's pain and help them walk through it and process it and heal. And I think there is obviously nothing more uh, in this country that we need more of than, than, than the ability to heal and to bring us together, to get us through this crisis and to make sure that we build back better. And I am just so excited at the prospect, hopefully, of him becoming president of the United States. Well, you know, that uh, uh, brings me to a closing question. You know, I, I really love my followers. Of course, I don't know a lot of them, but I- I see Molner's watching. Huh? I, yeah, John just gave us a thumbs up, you know, and I, it's really nice to develop a sense of community with people at a time where we are so, um, you know, at each other and the, the rhetoric has gotten so vituperative. That's my new favorite word. And, uh, and, and I'm curious, you know, how you think that we can bring the country together because you know, it, it, it has gotten, we, we've just been torn asunder and it's so upsetting, I think, in, in many ways. So, you know, how, what is the path towards reducing the, the level of, of, of hateful rhetoric and, and coming together and working together to solve some of the problems we have and not spending so much time just, you know, uh, yelling at each other and and hating on each other it just really i i think everybody is is exhausted from it i think that's right um th that's obviously a huge question and it, it's probably the most fundamental question that we face as a democracy because our ability to have a national conversation um which both includes our ability to talk to one another but also share a set of facts um, is the foundation upon which a, a, a healthy democracy is built. And so it's really one of the most fundamental questions we have. And I think that there's a number of solutions we need to, to, to sort of heal that divide and bring us together. But I think there's something 
sort of just simple and personal that I think all of us can do a better job of, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, an independent, conservative, liberal, progressive, moderate, no matter what, one of the things that I think we all need to do a better job of is truly listening and seeing one another's pain. Because I think one of the things that happens in our political discussions right now is that the left and the right can sometimes fall into the trap of saying, your pain isn't real, my pain is real, right? The, the, that we can sometimes diminish the pain of, of, of those living in post-industrial communities in the Midwest, while they can sometimes diminish the pain of sort of the, 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 the quote unquote cosmopolitan elite. Uh, and, and I think one of the things we have to do a better job of in this country is to say, we might not agree. In fact, we might disagree vehemently, but the challenges you face and the pain that you feel are real and we owe it to one another to try to solve those solutions. Because I think what happens is when we tend to have this, this sort of competition of pain, who is more oppressed, who is more challenged in our country, what it ends up doing is it ends up, ends up driving us further into our pain, further into our sides. When I'm upset, the worst thing that a person can do, even if it's well-intentioned, is to try to tell me why it's not as bad as I think, why the person didn't mean it. Because what ends up happening is I start defending my pain. I start defending why I'm upset and it only makes me angrier. And so if we did a better job, I think on all sides of feeling that empathy for one another, of recognizing the legitimacy of each other's pain, I think that's the foundation, that acknowledgement, that validation of pain is the foundation upon which we can begin to heal. It's not every step, it's not a silver bullet, but I think it is the foundation in our national discourse that will allow us to begin to move past the divisive, toxic nature of our politics. I also think, you know, I interviewed David Brooks the other day. I think politics have started to play too big a role in our lives. They're t it's taking up too much space and that we need to get back to helping each other, getting involved in our community working with with you know caring about a cause that we deeply care about and and david said that politics our our political identity has become our ethnicity mm. and um i think we protect it so much and and of course this is not an original thought that we've become so brought you know such so tribalistic that um you know i i don't know how to break through that and you know I'd love to figure out a way and something that I could do that would, would be helpful. But, um, you know, it's something that we need to start thinking about. And, and I think bring people together uh, to unify people. And, you know, I've said this before on these Instagram lives, Sarah, but, you know, I, we do have so much more in common than we think. And, you know, I do think that if, if Joe Biden is elected, one of the reasons why I think people have gravitated toward President Trump is that he he made them feel important and made them feel heard and seen. And whether it was sincere or not, he he paid attention. And, you know, I think he's he sowed a lot of division. But the fact that he was saying, I hear you. I see you just by his mere presence. And I think that's something that I'm hoping that if, if elected, Joe Biden will, will make sure that some of the people who have felt marginalized and forgotten for various reasons, economic despair, um, you know, uh, something that, that uh, Joan Williams wrote about in a book called, uh, she wrote it for the Harvard Business Review. And what was that called, Joan Williams? It was called, uh, it was about white anxiety, you know, yeah. changing graphics, changing economics, uh, that, that hopefully, um, you know, that, that those, those folks will feel a part and not feel left out of the American dream. White working class is the name of the book. I highly recommend it. Uh, to everybody. It's a small book. It's, it's basically a Harvard business school, uh, business, uh, school, article that was made into a book after 2016. And I, I really learned a lot about the dynamics and it's all comes down to psychology and many yeah. 
as Sarah? I, I think that's I think that that's so right. I mean, whether whether or not we agree with one another, we can we can acknowledge and recognize that people we disagree with, people who hold positions we may find abhorrent, that 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 they are still worthy of, of, of dignity and opportunity. That that every that that frankly, there are a lot of people in this country across ideology and identity who are forgotten. And, and and acknowledging that, I think sometimes we think that if we validate someone's pain, it will unintentionally validate their prejudice. Mm -hmm. And and it is a fine line, but we can we can we can validate pain without validating prejudice. And I think you you mentioned there's so much we have in common, and I think that's so true. And I think for me, the perfect antidote to the negativity and division in our national politics for me was running for office because mm -hmm. I talk to voters every day. When you get at, when you run at this level, you talk to dozens of voters a day, right? You try to call hundreds, but you talk to dozens of voters a day and you see just how much we have in common. Yeah. You see just how much we share in our, both our fears and our hopes. And you see just how hungry people are for a, a politics that's rooted in kindness and compassion. And, and so for me, this experience has been, been comforting and hopeful and awe-inspiring. And it showed me that, that while our politics at the federal level may seem so toxic that it's broken, that fundamentally the foundation of it, the goodness of the people, is there for us to repair our politics, heal this country, and move us forward. I sure as hell hope so, Sarah. <laughs> And by the way, people were asking about who, what, you know, what, what this is. I'm talking to my friend, Sarah McBride, who was elected to the Delaware State Senate yesterday. And uh, the title of the book. Oh, the title of the book. Sorry. Uh, the title of the book is Joe Williams. It's called uh, White Working. Did I say it's called White Working Class? Can we Google it? Yeah, it's. Joan's a, a law professor out in California in San Francisco. And it is called, no, that's not it. Anyway, she she uh, wrote this book. So it's called, and also the other one we were talking about, Hillbilly Elegy, a really good book. And, and Strangers in Their Own Land. Strangers in Their Own Land is another really good book. So, um, you know, and I think that there is, oh, it's called White Working Class. And what's the subtitle? I'm so blind. Overcoming Class Cluelessness in America by Joan C. Wilson. It's a great book and I highly recommend it. Well, Sarah, listen, tell your mom I said hi. I, I will. Said to Katie, congratulate you. I, I should have thought about it earlier. I know you've got Charlize and Amy Schumer and all these other people. No, you, you posted on your Instagram, I, I think what? last night. So she when she asked that, I was like, absolutely. Katie's already but said something. I reached out to you and texted you, congratulations. But it was such a crazy night, right? Oh my goodness. I think all of us were glued to uh, the internet or Twitter or TV. And for all the, the Trump supporters who have joined us for this conversation, you know, um, I hope we all can come together. And I, I can say sincerely that I want the best for you all too. And that, um, you know, hopefully we can turn the page and, and really start caring about each other. And, uh, you know, it's a democracy, so you can vote for whoever you want to. And I, you know, I'm just glad you exercised your right to vote. And, uh, and I'm excited for what the future holds for you, Sarah, because, you. you know, today, the state Senate in Delaware, tomorrow, who knows, right? <laughs> I'm just excited to serve. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves. If you guys like what you see, subscribe right here.